Welcome to Science Cafe. Thanks for coming. My name is Dan Marchek, and I'm one of the co-founders of Science Cafe. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking the Riverwalk Cafe for having us here. Uh, parking is always a challenge, so hopefully all of you aren't walking too far. So now I'll introduce our panel. We have from St. Joseph's, Pamela Deris. We have from the Alzheimer's Association, Kelsey Goslin. And Wendy Sage Matsis from uh, Bridges by Epic. And I will ask each of them to tell us a few minutes about who they are and answer the question, what do you think is hopeful about Alzheimer's? What's changing that gives you hope? My name is Pam Darris, and I'm blessed to be the manager of St. Joseph Hospital's Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. We are located behind St. Louis de Gonzague Church in Millette Manor. Uh, many of you know Millette as a school and as the convent, and now it's senior housing, and we are located in the basement, which is a wonderful place to be uh, because we have lots of space, and so we offer lots of programs. I'm a registered nurse. I've been a nurse for more than 40 years, and as happens, your life sort of follows a path that you didn't even realize it was going to follow. I started out nursing, doing geriatric nursing, and then started doing office nursing and then wound up doing parish nursing and came to work at St. Joe's as a parish nurse. And then we started doing Alzheimer's and dementia care. We started with a day away program and support groups. And so now we offer um, care consultations and meetings with folks. And I am just blessed out of my socks every day. We have a day away respite program that meets on Tuesdays at Millette. It is um, the highlight of the week. It is for folks who are early to beginning moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease, and it is just a fun day. And there are three or four of my volunteers who are here, and they can tell you that it's just absolutely amazing. We had one family who um, the dad had been the military man, and when he developed Alzheimer's disease, they saw a whole different side of their dad. And they got to know their dad heart to heart instead of the dad who had been the military man. They had gotten to know their dad in a whole different way. So there are frequently positives that come along with the diagnosis. Um, things that were important aren't important anymore. And so I think it changes our perspective. So I guess that's the hopeful part for me. My name is Kelsey Goslin. I'm with the Alzheimer's Association. I'm the manager of medical and scientific research engagement. So we focus a lot on um, research education, trying to bring the latest hope um, about research and the latest news to the community. Um, as the Alzheimer's Association, we also offer a variety of educational programs for free for the community. Many of you may have attended. Um, my colleague Carrie is over in the corner there, and you may recognize her. And so we really try to provide support for families who are currently working through this disease, while we're also trying to advance the research to ultimately find the cure. And we do that through policy efforts, through increased funding for NIH, as well as providing um, grants to researchers. We also try to raise public awareness about the importance of early detection and diagnosis of this disease. But we always are bringing it back to the families through support groups and those educational programs, as well as a 24-7 helpline available for families for any kinds of questions. And so I actually came into this work um, in a different way. So my background is in neuroscience. And so I was doing research, but I was really passionate about science communication and really bringing the science into the community and seeing how that intersects in a bigger picture. 
And so when I saw this job available, I thought it was a really good fit to tie in um, my engagement with the research community as well as research communication and science communication. So I think what I'm most hopeful about for this field right now is just seeing all of the breakthroughs that are happening. I know that we often hear in the news of clinical trials that have failed, but behind the scenes, we're seeing a lot of success in better detection methods and using biomarkers or biological markers where we're able to detect the disease earlier and also be much more specific to what type of changes are happening in the brain, and then using that information to better tailor therapies. So a lot of therapies that are currently in clinical trials right now are looking at different targets, and hopefully we see some success with those soon. My name is Wendy Sage Matsis, and I'm the Director of Community Relations at Bridges by Epic in Nashua. So we're a specialized memory care assisted living community. Um, so much like Pam, I spend my days sort of in the mix um, of being with people who are suffering with the disease, um, sort of saving families as they're struggling through the disease with their loved one. Um, our communities are all designed really based in research. Um, so we're spending a lot of time trying to understand the disease as well as care for those who are living with it. So all of our communities are really based in what we know about the disease and how individuals living with the disease need to be cared for in these specialized communities. Um, so I think if you had asked 10-year-old me, who uh, whose grandma was one of 16, and I was always following her around to hospitals and nursing homes visiting family, um, if I would ever work in healthcare specifically with seniors, uh, I would have said no way. I was a child who fainted a lot of times when I walked into places and saw needles. Um, so I sort of came about this in an odd way. I started in home care, raising money for an organization, and um, learned to love the individuals who were seeking whatever education, whatever support they could find, and here I am today. So my main role is to work with families on finding solutions. We're not always the right place for them. Um, we work with Pam and her group. Um, we're happy to help find resources out in the community because community living isn't right for every person with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, so that's really sort of where I spend my days. I think what um, is positive for me, I think, is seeing all of you. This is no longer a disease that people are afraid to talk about. This is no longer a disease that is only affecting a certain part of the population, which it never really did anyway. And to be more specific, yesterday my nine-year-old daughter spent some time at work with me running a program for our residents. We were doing cake decorating, and she could not wait to get there. So I think in some ways we're developing people, um, a community that wants to be involved, that wants to find out who this person is, not this person with Alzheimer's, but tell me how I can help you live your life the way you want to live it right here in this moment. So that makes me excited. Um, somebody once said to me, they're like, oh, maybe you're you know, creating a, a child who's going to change the world. And, and maybe we will. But I think all of us together are changing the lives of the individuals living with Alzheimer's. And I say we keep going forward doing that. Again, in the back here. I have a friend. I've known him for 60 years, which makes me a geezer, I guess. But I see him about three, four times a year, and I notice subtle changes in his behavior. For example, I visit him, and he can't find something in the kitchen, and he raves and rants at, yells at his wife that you've gone ahead and moved this. Somebody gives him a phone number to call, and it, he keeps dialing the wrong number. He accuses them of, of giving him the wrong number. But yet he's physically active, he's mentally active, but am, am I being... Uh, paranoid in my conclusions that maybe something is going wrong here? A lot of times we see uh, loved ones covering for the other one because they don't want to admit it themselves either. So they get into a different type of rhythm throughout the days where you do all of the decision making. You, you know, take away a lot of those factors that other people are picking up on because that way you can continue to exist in the world where you want to live. Um, without facing this head on. So I don't think you're being paranoid at all. I think a lot of times it's somebody from the outside who's recognizing. We get a lot of calls around December 1st after children have come home and seen their parents. On the phone, things are great. When you see it in person and you see what's been going on, a light bulb goes off that, uh-oh, mom and dad aren't doing as well as we thought they were doing.
And what happens when, I don't know about you, but if I can't find anything or I move something, it's my husband must have put it somewhere. He must have moved it. He must have done something with it. It's a normal instinct. If we can't find it, somebody else moved it. And so when you're in the midst of uh, the possibility of a disease process, it's normal to blame other people. That's just, I think that's part of being human. If I didn't move it, then you must have. And if I don't remember that I moved it, then definitely you did. Um, and they're more apt, what we find is that the caregiver who is with them all the time is the one who's going to get the brunt of it. We tell them that it is a backhanded compliment because the, the son who's out in California who comes riding in once or twice a year, she's going to bend over backwards and be wonderful and kind and loving and sweet to. And the daughter who's there with her every single day, she's going to give a hard time to. Well, she's not sure about the love of the son who's only coming in twice a year. She's not so sure of him. But she is sure of the love of the daughter who's there all the time. So she can get mad at the daughter because she knows the daughter will never leave. So that's the backhanded compliment, and it's very, very common. I'll say this kind of speaks to why it's so important to see your doctor or urge a friend to see a doctor if there are concerns. Um, we also, like I mentioned before, the Alzheimer's Association has a 24-7 helpline. If you're concerned or you're not sure how to talk to a loved one about changes you're seeing, please give us a call. We have social workers who are there to answer the phone to walk through those situations. Because as we noted earlier, sometimes it could be something as simple as a vitamin deficiency. And catching that early and, and being able to reverse that through vitamin supplements is a pretty easy fix. Um, and if it's something more serious, then it's good to go to your doctor and create a care plan and know what to expect. Yes, I wondered if you could please speak to the resources that are available for the caregivers. I would say if you're calling up someplace and they're not helping you find resources, you've called the wrong place, hang up and call somebody else. Um, caregiver support groups, which I know Pam runs, we run, the Alzheimer's Association runs, are a lifesaver. Um, and a lot of times they might be the only two hours that a caregiver is receiving throughout a month in order where something is focused on them. Um, so one of the things that we do in our community, we hold them twice a month. A big barrier to a caregiver going to a caregiver support group is who's going to care for your loved one with dementia. So we remove that barrier and we say bring them with. While you go to the support group, your loved one's coming with us. We're going to engage them in a program and they're going to enjoy a meal with us. A little bit of socialization also in case they're a little isolated. Um, so, you know, there's places I'll speak a little bit and then you guys as well. Um, I mean, I would say Service Link is a big one um, here in New Hampshire. They sort of are, they can piecemeal it out. They can give you ideas. They, you know, have all of the phone numbers listed, um, you know, whether you're trying to find Medicaid applications or housing or, um, you know, you just need somebody to talk to as well. So Service Link, they have an office here in Nashua, one in Manchester and one in Concord. And I'm sure there are others up in the, the Lakes regions. Um, you know, you've got places like Easter Seals. You have... Um, you know, your physician, you've got places like us, the Alzheimer's Association. And I'm going to let Pam take it because I know she deals a lot with caregivers who are walking through her door. Um, every Monday afternoon from 1 to 3, we have a caregiver support group. And between 14 and 20 people gather around the table and share what's in their heart and on their mind that they would never, ever share with anybody else. Because the people around the table understand in a different way. Because when you're walking the journey, you experience things. It's like nobody can ever understand unless you're walking in the moccasins. Well, that's exactly what it is. So people, caregivers, meet each other heart to heart. There's just no other way to describe it. So to have the ability to come every Monday from 1 to 3, it's an open group. Uh, we do not have the luxury of providing care for, for loved ones, which is something I wish we did, but we can't. Um, so every Monday we do that. We have, right now we're part of an, a group with the Alzheimer's Association that's called Taking Action that is helping people who are um, early in the process. It's a support group for the caregivers and it's a support group for the participants. So it's a one hour of education and then the group splits. So participants are together and caregivers are together. 
And that's huge because not only do you form relationships in caregiver support groups and in participant support groups, but for a lot of the participants, they don't have any other place to talk about this. They don't, caregivers have more access to support groups than people who have the disease. And we had one group, for some reason it had five men in it, all who had the disease, and all they wanted to talk about was driving and what it was like because they could no longer drive and who took away my car keys and who gave them the right to take away my car keys. And that was so important because we need, as human beings, we need to talk about what's going on. So we have that group, and then in, this, in January, we're going to start a um, savvy caregiver group, which is um, a new program that's come into New Hampshire. It's been in Massachusetts and in Maine, and it's to help caregivers cope better. It's a six-week program, and it's to help caregivers cope better with all that they have to de deal with. There's no job description for being a caregiver. There's no manual that says this is what you do and this is how you do it. If someone has cancer, you can pretty much tell what the symptoms are going to be. If they've had chemo or they've had radiation, you, can, you have a pretty much a road map of what this is going to look like. With po folks who have Alzheimer's disease, everything can be different five minutes from now than it is right now. It's a roller coaster ride. And you never know what's going to be in front of you. So because of that, caregiving for someone who has Alzheimer's disease is very, very difficult. And what we've discovered is that caregivers are really good at caregiving for their loved ones, but they're really not good at caregiving for themselves. And that's dangerous because it's a real high statistic of people who, will, who caregivers who will pass before the ones they're caring for because they don't take care of themselves. When you're prepared for whatever the behavior might be, you feel more empowered. And when you feel more empowered and you feel like more like you're in control, your stress level goes down. So anytime we can help folks understand what's going on in the process, and as Wendy said, and the Alzheimer's Association is another fabulous resource. That care consultation helpline at 2 o'clock in the morning when you don't know what else to do, having somebody on the other end of that phone that you can talk to is huge. To go off of all of these great resources, to talk a little bit more about what the Alzheimer's Association has, you've heard our helpline. Um, like Pam mentioned, this is 24-7, 24, 24 hours, 7 days a week. You'll always get a person on the other end whether it's just looking for other resources, whether it's a support group in your area, looking for education programs or day activities, or you're in a crisis or you're looking for someone just to talk to. And we have people who call our helpline. They're like, I'm not quite sure why I called, um, but I was told I should. And our care consultants are there to walk you through that process and really navigate and, and help find what, what are your challenges, what are your opportunities, what might be the next best steps for you. And we also offer care consultations, and so we have that 24-7 helpline, but we can also set up a one-on-one -on -one care consultation with you, either by phone at a different time or in person in one of our offices. So we do have an office in Bedford here in New Hampshire. Um, and then we offer many support groups at local community centers, uh, and education programs for caregivers, even for community members who may be concerned about their own memory, what are the signs I should look for, but for caregivers really focusing on communication <laughs> strategies, what are behaviors that I should expect, legal and financial planning, what to think about, and really trying to just engage and provide all of the support needed. I know you can't say a, a blanket answer, but do most, I can't even say do most, is one of the symptoms losing the ability to read and follow directions? What about like reading and, and comprehension? And because if, it, just for an example, if I, I leave a list on the counter, mom, these are your options for lunch. She'll just, she'll say, oh, I didn't eat lunch because I didn't know what to have. Or, and I know part of that is not being able to make a decision, but is part of that reading and reading comprehension? It can be, yes. Yes. Um. We, th we automatically read the words and understand what the words mean, but they don't. They, that processing that happens in the brain sometimes is just beyond what they can do at this point. 
Um, sometimes there are visual changes that have created that challenge for them. Um, and sometimes it's just the processing of the words. They just can't do it anymore. And you're right, making the decision is just beyond. And that's why, as Wendy said, having the two things, the two meals, you know, do you want spaghetti or do you want meatloaf? Because it's, and you don't even need to use the words, they can choose it. So yes, yeah, sometimes having the list on the, on the counter works for a while, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It could also not be the list. It could be their reading, but they're not quite certain how to prepare that. They might not know how to use That's the true. microwave anymore, or if it requires turning on the stove or finding something in a cabinet. Um, you know, so it might be time to consider meals on wheels. Maybe the meals need to be delivered. Make it as easy as possible because um, you don't know what that barrier is. But if she's not eating, that's a problem. Yes, you actually have touched on a few things that, that I was going to ask about. But how common is it for someone with dementia to become belligerent, to become threatening, to refuse to cooperate, to refuse, uh, like you talk about Meals on Wheels, well, they wouldn't allow that in the house, won't allow the house to be cleaned. And then you touched on this, the spouse who's with them uh, covers it up for them and will not confront or help the child confront any of these issues. So we see that every day. Um, a lot, of, again, they're losing control. So they're going to enforce themselves in whatever way possible, whether it's, nope, get out of my house to a caregiver or a cleaning lady or the Meals on Wheels delivery. Um, but you, I think you just keep trying. Sometimes it might be the person that's doing it. Um, we see that with our caregivers. I might not be the person that's connecting with our resident that he, you know, they might not take the, get in the shower for me. They might not take the medication from me. Um, so we redirect. It might take, you know, I mean, we've, we had a gentleman who the shower was out of the question, out of the question, out of the question. And so finally it was our maintenance director. You know, he's like, you smell and your wife's coming to visit you. So sometimes you just have to put it in as simple as terms as they can understand. Um, but certainly belligerent again. Um, I don't have, has anybody ever taken the virtual dementia tour you have? Um, I would, if, if I would encourage you to do so, You'll get a little piece of what living with dementia might be like, but that little piece is probably enough for you to have a little more understanding. Um, a lot of symptoms that come with Alzheimer's are neuropathy. So you start to lose feeling in your feet and your hands. Um, vision changes, your perception changes. So they'll have you wear goggles so you can't see anything. A lot of times you're hearing white noise in your head, but you're trying to hear what's being said to you also. So, you know... Try that all day, every day. The virtual dementia tour takes about 20 minutes. Um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. I had my mom do it. She was in tears at the end of it. She's like, I can't believe this is what she's living with. Um, there's also a, there's a book called On Pluto. It was written by a gentleman named Greg O'Brien. He was a former journalist. He lives down on the Cape. He's living with early on. Well, he had early onset dementia. He realized he probably had it as his mom was in the end stages of it. He's written a book about sort of what it's like to live with it. And he'll tell you, he's like, I get really angry because it's the only thing that people understand out of me. For some people, when the water's coming out of a shower, it looks like shards of glass to them. So can you imagine somebody's putting you in a shower and the water's coming down and you think it's shards of glass coming at you? So sometimes the visual changes that they're experiencing are part of the reason why they're having such a hard time taking a shower. So then it's, okay, how do we compensate for that? How do we lower that shower head so that it's right here so they're not seeing it coming at them? How do we wrap them up and keep them warm so that they can take a shower so that they're not frightened? And as they get more and more confused as the disease process happens, can you imagine people coming at you and trying to take your clothes off you? I mean... That's a scary prospect. So people who are trained, people who have, have the education to know how to work with folks with dementia, it's huge because they know how to approach them. They know how to get them to do the things that they need to do. 
and do it with love because we have to meet them where they are. It's their reality. doesn't matter what our reality looks like. It's their reality. And we have to enter into that place with them. About genes, there's really nothing we can do about our genes. But there are many things we can do with our bodies, our minds. Our, um, and I'm wondering if you take somebody who's in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who does not yet have Alzheimer's, what, what would you recommend that person do to stay away from Alzheimer's. So this is a big area of research right now. It's looking at risk factors and identifying lifestyle interventions. And so a report last summer came out by The Lancet by a commission that they made, and they looked at risk factors across the lifespan and specifically risk factors that are modifiable. Because you're right, we don't, we're not in control of our genes. We're not in control of our age, which are also risk factors. But we can control things like maintaining our cardiovascular health and exercising. Um, taking care of our mental health, because um, symptoms of depression can often show as cognitive decline, so making sure to go to your doctor when you may experience those kinds of symptoms. Um, paying attention to diet, um, maintaining, if you have diabetes, making sure that that's kept under control, um, quitting smoking if you currently smoke. All of those are risk factors that we know are associated with cognitive decline and dementia that we have control over. Um, and so this commission, they actually estimated that if we were able to modify all of these factors across the lifespan, that we may be able to cut the risk of dementia in the world by 30%. Um, one other lifestyle intervention that I forgot to mention is formal education. So I know it's hard for us, we can't just go back to college now, but even just taking a class at a community center or teaching yourself a new skill, such as a new language or something, that all helps our brain make new connections and function better. So those are all things that we can do now. So understanding that CTE and dementia are very different. Um, has there been any correlation between repeated hand injuries, um, people who may, myself included, played sports as a kid, come up <clears throat> multiple head injuries, but also had a grandfather with Alzheimer's and a mother with early onset dementia. Um, do those things correlate to an increased risk in people in that situation? We refer to that as traumatic brain injury. And so we often think about that in major sports like football, for example, where there's a lot of high, hard contact. So there is a correlation with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury and the and uh, cognitive decline and dementia, specifically CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's much more common in like major league football players, boxers, um, and it's more that repetition and even repetition of minor traumatic brain injury. Um, so there is that correlation there, but whether it's specifically for Alzheimer's disease or CTE or a different type of dementia, I think the research is still out. Um, but there definitely is that correlation for uh, CTE and, and high contact sports. But again, this is at the major league levels. Um, but it's important to take care of your brain. That's why wearing a helmet, wearing your seatbelt in the car, anything you can do to be preventative is really important. There's a doctor in Boston, Dr. Robert Stern, who's either at BU or BC, BU, um, who's doing a lot of research on the correlation between the concussion injuries, CTE, and dementias. You mentioned a male support group where they talked about their licenses being taken away. Who makes the decision when the license should be taken away? We always tell families to blame somebody else, so whether it's the doctor that's taking it away or disconnect the battery cables so that the car just doesn't start because it is, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, that's what they spent their time talking about. We have some tip sheets on it about when to take away the keys or when to hang up the keys. Um, it's pretty hard to get, you know, the, your license taken away as far as the, by a physician unless there's, you know, real issues there. And sometimes they'll avoid going to the doctor so that that doesn't happen. 
we send people, Northeast Rehab and the Hartford Insurance Company both have programs that you can go to and have your loved one tested. And it's an occupational therapist who puts them through the paces and then actually sometimes will go out on the road with them. The gift of that is then somebody on the other side of the table is telling your loved one they can't drive. And you can sit over here with your loved one and say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. But it's not you who's making that decision. It's, it's a professional who's then saying, you really don't have the skills, either cognitively or physically, um, to, be, to be driving. And you don't want to hurt somebody. So, um, and it is, especially, sorry guys, with men. You know, keys are our freedom. You know, from the time we're old enough to drive, 16, you get that license, that's the freedom. And so taking the car keys away is a huge, huge challenge. And so when you don't, and sometimes doctors won't make the decision. Sometimes doctors do not want to be put in that position. And so if you can go and have the testing done, then, then you're not the bad guy, the doctor's not the bad guy. Because if the doctor takes the keys, a lot of times then they don't want to go ever back to see that doctor again. So then when somebody else does it, it frees everybody else up. So I could ask the doctor to prescribe that test? Is that what I would do? You can ask for a referral. Or actually, okay. you can even do it. You can call um, Northeast, Northeast Rehab. They have an office here in, in Nashua um, and set up an appointment. It's not cheap by any means, but uh, for a lot of families, it solves the problem. My ex-mother-in-law had Alzheimer's and she would forget her age. Uh, her two sisters also had it at the same time and they all thought they were 30 years younger and I remember them looking in the mirror and not recognizing themselves. I've heard the memory loss being uh, likened to uh, peeling back the layers of an onion. C can you speak uh, anything about that? You ask somebody with dementia how old they are and it's however old they think they are on that day because they might not remember that they were born in 1927 and it's 2018. For them, it's 1960. So they're, you know, the age that they feel that they are and the time that they're living in. Um, certainly it's frightening. Um, but if you're not living in today's world then you're not who you are today, you're who you were when you had young children at home or when you were still working at BIE systems and the engineering department and you had a project and a deadline and I need to get to work. Um, we have a resident who's 101, and every day she is looking for the bus stop so that she can go home because her parents are going to be pretty angry at her. So we actually, um, we built a bus stop in our courtyard, and it's got the bus route for Taunton, Massachusetts, which is where she was from, and she can sit there and wait for the bus, and gosh darn it, where is that bus? It must have broken down. And then she'll go on to something else, but daily. Um, so it's unfortunate because that's part of the disease, but as we've said, you just, that's where you meet them. So if they're 60 um, today and they're actually 97, be 60 with them. What, how great is that? They finally found a time machine. And for a lot of folks, you just have to take the mirrors down. We had one family who had the mirror on the door and he, she would pace the hall and pace the hall and pace the hall. And we said, just cover the mirror or take it down because she was getting so agitated because she thought that that person was another person. She didn't recognize herself. And so she would look at that and she was, she was just all upset all the time. He took the mirror down and she was fine. So sometimes taking the mirrors down, if it causes confusion, take it down. We had black cats that, you know, the decorations over the door jams? We had black cats that were on the door jams. And Janice Funk came to the center. She's a neuropsychologist from Massachusetts. And she said, Pam, you've got to take those down. And I looked at her and she said, they're going to think that those are actual cats jump that are getting ready to jump on them. Didn't occur to me, but that's it. Their perception is different. So we took the cats down. People have to cover mirrors. There was a woman who had a life-size picture of her son in the corner, and she thought a man was in her bedroom every night. Once they covered the picture, she was fine. So sometimes it's looking through different eyes to see what it is that's upsetting them and causing them to sundown. 
You mentioned something earlier on I wanted to come back to, and that was early onset dementia. Can you comment on that? What makes it different? Um, you know, what is that all about? Yeah, so I'll talk kind of biologically what makes it different, and then if you want to touch on the symptoms that are, are if there's any differences. So when we think of Alzheimer's disease, we often think of it affecting older individuals, and it typically does happen to individuals who are over age 65. That's when it's most common. So we refer to that as late onset Alzheimer's disease, or more just generally Alzheimer's disease. But there are individuals who develop the disease before age 65 in their 40s, 50s, sometimes even earlier. And this is called younger onset or early onset Alzheimer's disease. In terms of what's different, we do often see that genetic association in the younger onset cases. And so it's usually in families. So usually their parents developed the disease before age 65 and their parents developed it earlier. And they often, the children um, often develop the disease around the same time, around the same age that the parents developed the disease. So there really is this tight correlation with the genetics. Um, in terms of how the pathology or the brain changes are different, we still see that buildup of amyloid beta and tau tangles and Alzheimer's disease. But some of the research that's comparing these two groups is really trying to differentiate if there are different changes. And they've found that it's more common in early onset Alzheimer's disease to just see the amyloid beta and tau. Versus in late onset, we often see these mixed pathologies that Pam mentioned earlier, where they may have the buildup of amyloid beta and tau, but may also have some vascular dementia, have some of those mini strokes in the brain. So it's, it's much more complicated often later in life. So this is kind of a new area of research of, of studying these two groups differently and at different times. Um, a lot of the clinical trials right now are for treatments for individuals who are over age 65, but there are some studies specifically looking at individuals who are younger onset. So there's the Diane study. The, um, it's out of Washington University in St. Louis. And then they only study individuals who have early onset Alzheimer's disease associated with that genetic factor. And so they're studying these groups of individuals over their lifespan to see how the, the disease progresses to get more information on how to better detect it, but also trying therapy specifically in this group to see if maybe there's a therapy that works better for people who have um, early onset. Um, and so I think a lot of this research now is trying to differentiate what are the differences, what are the similarities, how do we treat these individuals differently? And it's very hard and very challenging for families um, to be 50 years old and have your spouse diagnosed with, with early onset Alzheimer's disease. You know, you may still have kids in college. Um, we've had situations where we've had, we had a woman who was in her 40s and she had she still had young kids. So you've, you're, now you're dealing with the family dynamics of um, college kids or young kids, and you've got a spouse who still needs to work because he, still, he or she still needs to support their family, and yet somebody needs to be with the loved one um, who has the disease process. Um, it's, it is a very, very challenging situation for the families. Um, and for, for um, the, the loved ones, um, sometimes you've got a uh, an older family member, an aunt or a mom, who's actually taking care of her child who has the, the disease because family members need to work. That's just part of our life today. And so it's, it's a real struggle and a real hard time for families with the early onset. One other thing I will mention, though, this is very, very rare. So I don't want everyone to be worried about yourself necessarily. Um, it's very, very, very rare. Um, and like I said, it does typically run in families. Um, it's not quite as sporadic as, as the later onset Alzheimer's disease. Is the progression the same? Is it the same disease? It's, I would, I mean, from what I know of it and... Um, those that I've seen with it, it actually progresses faster in early onset. We have a gentleman living with us who's 62, and, you know, when it hit, it hit. Um, his wife tried as hard as she could to keep him home. She was working. Um, she tried, the, you know, to hire the caregiver in the home, and that's not working out, so he's now living with us. And I would say that um, him, as well as others that we know of and have seen, it definitely progresses at a faster rate, and I don't know 
there's rhyme or reason to that. And maybe it's better. We had one gentleman who was part of our day away program who was, he had just retired. He was 56. And he was reading to kids in school as a volunteer. And he started to notice that he couldn't find the words as he was trying to read with the kids. And so the diagnosis was made. And he came to us. And it was an incredible gift for us because he could tell us what this was like, what this felt like. Um, and so he, it was a tremendous education for all of us. And he was grateful that he could come and be with us. Um, but he was also grateful that he could, he could teach. There was a benefit to uh, being able to share the experience, as awful as it was. Um, but the fact that he could, he could share with it. And he, he, the disease did progress more quickly with him, and it has with several others that we've had in our program. A factor in that, too, is that since we often think of Alzheimer's disease as an older disease, it's often harder to diagnose early onset Alzheimer's disease, so it may take longer to get that diagnosis. Um, and that's why if you are concerned, find resources, call our helpline, call one of these organizations here, and really try to figure out strategies and how to advocate for the testing that you may need for your loved one. And get involved in a research trial because those are phenomenal. You can get all of the testings that you won't, your insurance company won't pay for. If you get involved in a research trial, they'll, they, and a lot of them, there were several of them who were in Boston who were actually paying participants to be part of it, but they would drive them from Boston. They would come up and pick them up and take them back to Boston and then bring them home. And they wanted them to be part of the trial. So, you know, don't think that just because it's in Boston, it's not an option. And just to jump off of that, if you are interested in participating in a clinical trial or other research study, the Alzheimer's Association actually has a matching tool to help you confidentially find studies that may be a good fit for you. There's studies for healthy volunteers, caregivers, and people living with the disease. And so we developed Trial Match, which is a tool that you can access online or by phone for free. You complete a profile, it matches you to research studies and sorts it based on distance, and also categorizes it based on whether it's a diagnosis study or a prevention study or treatment or even just quality of life. Um, and this is confidential, so it's not a registry. The research site will not reach out to you. Instead, it's a good way to just find information, and then you can make that outgoing call or email if you're interested. Is there any current research on the correlation between Alzheimer's and Down syndrome? Yes. And so Down syndrome, we know there's three chromosomes instead of two, which is normal. And so it turns out that one of those genes that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, the APP gene, it's actually located on that chromosome that's triplicated. And so there's a lot of correlation um, between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease and dementia, where individuals who have Down syndrome often do develop dementia. And they think it might be partly because of that genetic component. Um, so there is a lot of research looking at that correlation and what the mechanisms are and how best to treat it especially now that individuals with Down syndrome are living longer since there's better care and support, um, starting to see that trend more. Okay, there's an ugly elephant in the room and that's the cost of all of this. Uh, can you give us some idea of maybe macro and then micro cost to the families uh, about this disease? I mean, I can speak to the cost of like living in a community. Um, is that where you're going with this? Or are you talking overall insurance, cost of unpaid caregivers? If you can give us some idea of uh, what normal care costs are and uh, for families and then how much of this is covered by insurance, if any of it, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I know there's been some information on the macro and they're talking about billions and billions of dollars uh, to the nation as a whole. So I think our research is well placed to find some some answers here, but uh, we seem to be pretty far from it. Oh, by the way, thank you for the, uh, I work for Meals on Wheels uh, one day a week, so thank you <laughs> the for plug. the <laughs> plug on them. Uh, they do a great job, and thank they you do. for that. They do a great job. Um, so I can speak a little bit about the cost of the families. I mean, the one thing I can say is, you know, we often get calls, and does Medicare cover this? And the answer is um, the cost of a, living in a community, 
or for the most part, the cost of like in-home care, the answer is no. Medicare covers acute costs. So your physician appointments, if you're hospitalized, if you need rehab, you know, in a skilled nursing facility after a hospitalization. Sometimes you can get Medicare to cover some home care, but if it's you're considered homebound and you need some IV therapy or some continued PT or OT at home, Medicaid comes into play. If you have really no resources and you're looking to Medicaid, um, you know, to basically fund your um, health insurance needs. Um, and typically, if you're using Medicaid, you're probably a little more limited um, than anybody. Um, so you've got choices for independence through the Medicaid program, which means you can get some support at home. Um, community living is probably out of reach because... Most assisted livings, us included, don't accept Medicaid. Um, it's a bit of a flawed system. So the cost for our community starts at $7,955 a month. That's all inclusive, um, and that's pretty typical. It, you know, it goes, depends on the size of your apartment. Um, research sort of shows that if you need more than 16 hours of care in your home, you're probably, it's more cost effective to move to a community because you're reaching over that plus you're maintaining the cost of your home. Medicaid reimburses assisted living, I think the last time we checked was at $42 a day. So unfortunately, assisted livings can't accept Medicaid because you can't pay your staff for what Medicaid's gonna pay you. So for the most part, if you're, you're looking for a Medicaid placement, you're looking to a nursing home. And sadly, there's a real crisis for Medicaid beds in the state of New Hampshire, at least, because about 20 some years ago, they put a moratorium on how many nursing beds could be in the state. Yep. So as the need increased, the number of beds stayed the same. And even they're decreasing because some nursing homes have gotten rid of certain beds because it was more cost effective to do so. So right here we go. Um, so. That's the cost I can tell you about sort of community living, home care. I think home care is usually around $23 to $24, $25 an hour, unless it's overnight care, and they usually require a three-hour minimum if you want somebody to come into your home to do that. There are some other great programs, some volunteer programs, um, you know, that might help some companion type of stuff. So if somebody doesn't need a lot of you know, real nursing care, not, not a lot of help, but maybe just some companions, you might be better off to give you caregivers a break. Um, but if you're looking for care, it is incredibly expensive. And I think you guys can probably talk about what it's doing to the, the care system as well. If you're looking for some, for a day program for your loved one right now, they're running anywhere between 80 and $110 a day. Um, for a medical model day program. Our program's a social program, so we don't fall into that category. Um, but, and the, the hard part is then finding folks who can come in to care for your loved one in your home. Uh, we have a very low unemployment rate in New Hampshire. And a lot of times those folks who are working within um, the agencies who come in and care for your loved one have a hard time finding folks who are willing to come in for the wage that they can afford to pay. Um, same thing is true in nursing homes. So a lot of times the facilities are having a hard time finding staff because if the nursing home is paying $12 an hour um, for caring for, for your loved ones in a nursing home and Whole Foods is paying 14 and Hobby Lobby is paying 16 um, they have a real competition on their hands, and, and, and as Wendy mentioned, um, Medicaid does not reimburse the nursing homes a great deal of money, So, um, which is why the private pay costs are so high. I went to get the sheet of paper because these are st some of the statistics that I had seen in an article, and you mentioned cost, and according to this article, um, caring for Alzheimer's and other dementia patients by the year 2015, it's going to be $1.1 trillion by the year 2050. That's a lot of money. So you're, it's, it's, um, it's extremely expensive. Um, Long-term care insurance, if you have it, will frequently help pay some of the costs. But a lot of the long-term care insurance companies are trying to get out of the business because they're losing money. 
So I will say, because that, that is a statistic, and these numbers are actually uh, researched by the Alzheimer's Association each yep. year. Uh, every Around March or April each year, we put out the facts and figures report. You can access that online at alz.org slash facts. And you can see all of the statistics on how much it costs. And that's why it's so important to advocate. Talk to your state representatives about the lack of nursing beds. Um, talk about how this is affecting your community and families and, and ask for better care and support um, from both the state and, and federally. Um, we have an advocacy day in New Hampshire every year. And then we also go down to Capitol Hill. We bring a ton of families and advocates and really try to increase NIH funding for research, increase care and support for families. And we're making improvements. The New Hampshire Healthcare Association, which is an organization based in Concord, one of their main functions is really to lobby for, um, you know, not only Alzheimer's type of support, but really just healthcare um, in general. But they do a lot of work on the, st the state house floor, too. Um, and they have a campaign running now. It's called I Am Worth It. And it's basically... Um, focused on residents of nursing homes and assisted livings and receiving support in home um, because funding was cut not so long ago and they were threatening to cut it even more. And so they worked hard um, and they got some stuff put back in the budget. And, you know, I don't know all of the logistics about that, but the, um, it's nhhca.org, I think is their website. And they do a lot of work, um, you know, and they're always happy to come and speak and do different things too. But certainly the cost is, Sometimes, you know, it's just staggering to really think about it and, and wonder what else that money could have been used for. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> I guess I'll close the session, ask you to thank our panelists. They were excellent.